Good afternoon everyone and welcome to the School Garden Masterclass. My name is Kat Picarvis. Many of you here in the room I know and it's so wonderful to have you here as part of the Health and Wellbeing Queensland Pick of the Crop crew. We've got a group of people... Oh, I need to go behind the mic, okay. Sorry guys. The mic here is for our friends that are online. So I will just mention that there's people here in the room at Marsden State School and thank you Marsden for hosting us today. We also have people joining from the Logan region, but also Bundaberg and Bowen. So hi to you guys online and thanks for joining us. In terms of a couple of housekeeping things to keep in mind as we go, as we mentioned, we've got our friends online. So please guys, you're part of this experience today too. So if you've got questions, there's a live chat. We've got people sharing your questions with us as we go. So we can't wait to hear what you've got to say and, and if you've got anything that you need answered. For us here at Marsden State School, a couple of things to keep in mind is that um, we have a film crew following us around. They've been here for a few hours. There's cables on the ground. So just keep an eye on where you're walking. Uh, and if Tiffany, who's walking around with the camera, is near you, you might just need to take a, a step away or she'll get a really nice view of your face. <laughs> if anyone has any problems with being on film, please just let us know and we'll make sure that you're behind the camera at all times. This will become a recording so that it's going to be available to you and to your colleagues and friends to be able to keep sharing the learnings that we'll go through today. In terms of other important housekeeping, because it's being filmed and because we've got a really tight time schedule today, we've got three incredible people who are sharing their time. When they're talking, if we can just listen, and again, we will have chance to ask questions towards the end of each presentation. If there's anything burning as we're going, please do, don't hesitate to ask in the moment as well. Um, we do also, will be partly inside this room and partly outside. If we're inside and anything goes wrong, there's your exit. Um, if you do need a bathroom, you just head back out the way you came. And before you get to the end of the building, there's a toilet on your right hand side. Have I missed anything? No. So again, thank you so much Marsden State School for hosting. It's really great to be here today. As I mentioned, we've got a packed program. We're gonna to open today's program with a very special welcome to country from local traditional owner, Auntie Robin Williams. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon, everybody, or Jingri, which is hello in Yugambe. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank Marsden State School for putting on this event, and what a wonderful event it is. It's something to help our children or our jarjams to grow, and it'll also help them to become gardeners in their own right, and they can take these things that they learn from this garden, and they can take them home and show mum and dad, or their brothers and sisters, or tell Nana and Pop how to grow things, you know, because that, that's the sort of stuff children or Jarjans love. They love to be able to get out there in the garden and to grow things. So what a wonderful initiative, and I'd like to thank each and every one of you who um, has started this program. So, yeah, and for those of you that don't know me, um, I'm a proud Mullinjali woman through links on my, mom, on my dad's side and a Birigaba woman through links links on my mum's side and as a Mullinjali woman we're part of the Yugan Bear language region and that region goes from Beanley in the north to Tweed in the south out to Bow Desert and parts of Stradbroke Island and I'm proud to stand up here this afternoon to welcome each and every one of you. I would also like to acknowledge all elders of all cultures both past, present and future for without their knowledge, wisdom, guidance and forethought we wouldn't be where we are today and I sincerely give them thanks and it's upon the shoulders of those elders is where we have come to today so they have placed their footprints in the sand or for us today in the garden so now we must follow those footprints and we continue that journey that our elders have taken before us and look I just want to wish you all the best I think this is great that you know we can teach our children that there's other foods besides fast foods and you know and you can grow it in your own garden so I think it's wonderful I'll, I'll come back again later in the year to see how it's all going just to, to see what they have grown so Jingi Walu, Walu Jimbi, welcome to Yugan Bear Country and good luck with this project. Thanks. 
Wonderful. Thank you, Arnie Robin. It is an absolute treat to have you here today. And I will just take a moment to also acknowledge the land on which we're gathering here at Marsden State School and pay my respects to elders past and present. And also acknowledge that, as I mentioned, there's people joining from other regions of the state. So pay my respects to other nations that are joining in for these discussions today. We have, as I mentioned, a packed program and we're about to begin with local Aboriginal knowledge sharer, as he calls himself, Uncle Boomerang. We're going to take you on a journey into this absolutely stunning Marsden State School Indigenous Cultural Garden. And Uncle Boomerang has had a huge involvement in getting this garden up, running, sustaining and integrated into the learning here at Marsden State School. So we're really excited to go on a tour of this garden, to sit in their beautiful yarning circle and to have the chance to learn more, share more and anything that I've missed, Uncle Boomerang? No? Shall we go? Thank you. All right, the camera's rolling, everybody. We're going to take a walk outside. Thank you, Aunty Robin. That means thank you in our lingo. And I'll say to Aunty, Karawuga Walawa. That means all the best and take care. Yo, Aunty. Deadly. My name is Paul Barragan. Um, I am a Turrbal, Jugara, Birimbara descendant, Bunjalung, Yugambe language groups. And my, on my mum's side, they are Roberts, and I was born in Brisbane in Musgrave Park in 1965. And I didn't live for, in Brisbane long, but I've lived in southeast Queensland and northeast New South Wales all of my life. Travelled around Australia working, and the last 20 years I've been visiting schools and early learning centres, sharing the little bit of knowledge I have with teachers and educators and students, and I love it, and I have fun, and I learn every day myself. And I tell the students, I'm a student of life just like you. I'm learning every day and it's so wonderful. Whether it's from books or elders or other people, non-Indigenous and Indigenous. So my dad's side, they were convicts sent out here for stealing a cow. So, uh, but my mum's side, big mixture, German, Irish, Aboriginal. <laughs> like most Australians, we're mixed breed, eh? They make the best working dogs, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> so let's go for a walk. Auntie, you're leaving, so are you? Lovely to see you. So wonderful. So are any of you guys, you guys might be from schools or your educational houses or maybe gardeners, uh, groundsmen, I see maybe. So <clears throat> thank you to um, Marsden State School. This is a wonderful space. And I remember when it was bare and it was amazing how well um, Susie and the staff have got the kids involved and they've, they've got a list of plants off me but as I say to all schools, I can give you the basis but you have to make it your own. Seek other people's knowledge and wisdom as well. I don't have it all, I've got bits and pieces. Ask around and same with your nurseries when you buy plants um, that are endemic or non-endemic as long as they're native and um, to Australia. Some schools, they planted a few other uh, trees that, you know, fruit trees that are from other areas of the world that have been naturalised here in Australia. So they've been brought in. And our old people, they used, grandfather showed me how to make fire sticks out of, who's heard of a plant called, um, what's the one the cows eat? And they lantana. You know lantana, so it grow mad through the rainforest. He showed me how to make fire sticks out of it, and that's an introduced species. Another one, Crofton weed, where he chewed it and put it on your cuts and you, and you cover it with paper bark and tie it up. You make some string out of bark and then it's healed nearly the next day. It's incredible. So that's introduced stuff as well. So imagine all the, our knowledge that's been lost about plants, you know. But one thing um, Susie's done is put these uh, Marsden School here, they put these wonderful uh, plant markers with the name, uh, the botanical name, the common name, and a few of the uses. 
and some schools have put uh, more traditional the traditional names when we can when we can find them um, and also some of the traditional uses as well as the modern day uses so we're going to take a little walk down here and then we're going to come back up around on the other side and have a look at the other plants and have a bit of finish it with a bit of a yarn and the yarning circle there we might start here. See, this is one of, one of my favourite ones that grows along the beach everywhere. Now, if everyone's been walked over the sand dunes to the beaches, you would have seen this one growing. It's called pig face. Funny name for a plant. Um, I'm not sure that our traditional name in Yogan Bear here, but you can, use, you can use the fruits, you can eat the fruits, and you can also use the leaves if you can open them up like this inside is a jelly substance and you when you when you're at the beach what might you get stung by blue bottles put it on and hold it on and it takes the sting away so just like um, European aloe vera this one's useful too but the sea the um, flowers, once they beautiful purple flower there, and then they'll turn in, they'll close on itself. And the ones that grow, it's funny, the ones that grow near the beach, when, you, when they're real succulent, you squeeze them and you suck it, they're salty, they're sweet salty. But the ones that grow inland, you lose that salty taste. So the leaves, just like um, our old people used to get the mangrove, grow leaves when they cook their fish, they'd lick the salt off the leaf, have a bit of fish. Lick another leaf, have a bit of fish. So there's your salt. And there is a pepper vine as well, <laughs> but you can't eat it. Um, this beautiful tree here is one of my favorite bush tuckers and it's got some on it at the moment. Um, it's a native mulberry tree. Now these mulberries look nothing like your European mulberries that are purple in color and stain everything. We might be able to zoom in, there's some here. I'm gonna move it down so you can see them. Can you see these here? These little white balls with the seeds on the outside. A lot of, it, a lot of our native fruits have the seeds on the outside, like native roll, mul, mul, uh, raspberries and mulberries. But these are very delicate, about the size of a midgen berry. You gotta pick them off real gentle, let them roll into your hand. If you squeeze them too hard, they'll just squash their jelly. But they're real sweet, they're good little treats. If you get a handful of them, mmm, delicious. So they're all, and this is one of our seasonal indicator plants as well. So we have six seasons here, local seasons. The ones you guys know, summer, autumn, winter, spring, they come from Europe, don't they? So they're not specific to our area. This season is a special one, one of my favorite seasons. Just after summer, we have Wujuru Wungara. And, and you heard of a famous Aboriginal auntie called Ujuru Walker from North Stradbroke Island, famous Aboriginal poet. That's her totem, the tea tree. Ujuru is the tea tree. Wungara means flower, tea tree flower the season when the tea tree flowers. That tells me, when I look at the star map, I know that the mullet are leaving the river, the Guiyang, and to head north and to lay their eggs. So I watch for Maragimpa, Mibbon, the sea eagle, following the mullet. So then we know when to, where the mullet are. We, don't, we can't see out there, but above, the birds are following sea. We might go down here and have a look at a few other these other plants. Does anyone have any questions? I've just got a comment. I think mm. maybe it's the season, but I also know the students love coming and eating. Do they? That's awesome. <laughs> That's good that they're utilised. Look, any of your schools out there that are, that are planting stuff, I've been to schools, um, you know, one of the oldest local bush tucker gardens, a man, a wonderful man by the name of Glenn Leeper. He wrote Mangroves to Mountains and many other books. They done at Eagleby South State School, the Bush Tucker Garden in 1980. It's 40 years old. Go and have a look at it. We've just been cleaning it up last year, but so established trees, some of them 40, 50 meters tall. 
we'll go down here and have a look. So native mulberry. Um, this one here, you can also uh, make fire sticks out of the stems. So you cut off a stem, you take the outside bark off, you straighten it in the fire and harden it, and it's for your waverer. Your waverer is your fire, your top fire stick, and you put it on a base, a cottonwood, a native hibiscus. Um, bottom, spin it. Friction fire drill, they call it. We call it waverer. <coughs> this one over here, with the spiny, <coughs> spiny prickles, <coughs> is a finger lime. So there's three or four species of those. And um, has, has anyone tasted finger limes? They're delicious, eh? A lot of different things you can do with them, but they're very pretty inside when you cut them open. And there's different colours. You can get ones with, I think, pink and yellow and red. And they look really handsome on dishes, so they look deadly. Um, there's a new one they've planted. White aspen. That's a new one. So they're, they're very bitter if you've tasted those. But I've been told they're high in vitamin C and so when you bite one, as soon as it, that you break through that skin, your face goes like this, like a sour plum, like your burdekin plum. But stick with it because if you're in the bush, you, your body needs that. So that's a white aspen. There's also a lemon aspen. There's one of my favourite ones over there, midgem berry. That's it. Uh, yeah, that's midgem berry. So they get a little, a lot of them grow along the coastal regions as well with the pig face. So um, in the sand dunes, in the real poor soil in the sand, you'll get pig face, midgem berry, cotton wood, which you can make string, fire sticks and spears out of, all within two or three metres from the high tide mark. It's amazing. Goat foot vine, which you can take the leaves off and you heat them near the fire till they bubble. And then the same vine you tie around your head if you've got a headache, and I don't know what it does, but it takes your headache away. It's probably like a placebo effect. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yes, it, they are. They are slow growing, very slow growing. And one problem with them, different species, they have, they all have, to my knowledge, have uh, spikes, as they called, spines, spikes, um, thorns, whatever. And some are bigger than others. So I don't recommend them for early learning centres. For schools, you've got to have them in a certain spot and warn the students, don't lean down quickly and, you know, because you always worry about the soft bits on their faces if you get a spike in your eye. But yeah, that's them there. They are very slow growing and they're very, and very slow fruiting. They're like midgen berries and macadamia nuts. I think they take quite a few years. Right. Yes. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> but yeah, they like, um, sometimes people think, you know, because they've got the word citrus, they, they need full sun, they, they will grow in a little bit of shade as well, so sometimes mm. they like that a bit better, so that can be another tip. Yeah, they're a rainforest plant, they like, are. you know, a lot of our plants, they are, so the ones that, most of the ones you've, we've put in here at Marsden, they're subtropical plants, but they have got some from the tropics as well, so I say to schools, Nat, if you want to plant I've got a plant list that I'm happy to share, but find out what's endemic to your area. So what is local? So they will grow best. But then if you're bringing in another species from somewhere else, a, a, a native species, make sure with the council and whoever plant experts that it's not an invasive species. Because you know, with our beehives, the council brought down a heap of um, Trilliana, I think they're called trees, and they, everyone planted them everywhere, and the native bees go nuts on them when they're in flower. But they choke up the beehive 
with this horrible sticky resin and they have a meltdown when it gets too hot and they all die. So stuff like that. You need to be cautious and be aware of if you're bringing plants from other areas that they're not invasive species, even though they might be natives. But um, yeah, slow growing outside in the open sun. So we'll, we'll go along. There's a lot of different plants, medicine plants and food plants. And I mean, I know limited amount that grandfather taught me and Uncle Russ Butler, he's from Townsville, a few other elders, but um, so much of our knowledge has been lost. But there's heap of great books out there you can read. So many, and so many people with knowledge that are willing to share it as well. Elders and knowledge holders. And a lot of our plants I found from when, Grant, when I th walked through the scrub with grandfather in Numanbar Valley and Kurumban Valley and Talabudra Valley and up through the rainforest. They have multi-purposes multi and multi-uses. So you might, one tree you might use the leaf, the bark, the stems, the roots, and the sap, or more. So there's five or six uses of, of things that you can use off one plant. So the sap might have been used to either chew, like a chewing gum. It might have been used to dry and grind into a powder to make a resin, a glue, uh, sort of like lith lithic heat treatment. So you mix certain percentages. So one grandfather taught me is grass tree resins, 70%. 20% charcoal, ground up into as fine a powder as you can, and 10% gunung. That means kangaroo poo. And the, the three perfectly match 70%, 20, 10, mixed together and then heated, makes this hard resin. So you roll your spear and you tip through the powder, then you heat it on the fire. We just use a Bunsen burner now. It's much easier. <laughs> Do things here. This lady asked me the other day, I had a beautiful um, old black wattle boomerang, and she said, Oh, did you make that boomerang traditional style? I said, I sure did. Four inch angle grinder, traditional angle grinder from Bunnings. <laughs> <laughs> we don't do things the hard way when you can do things the easy way. <laughs> but this is so nice that schools and um, because all, all of the school subjects cross over into Aboriginal knowledge. So our people, everything they done every day involved some form of science, whether it was from food preparation or making tools, utensils, weapons, weaving, some form of science. But more than that, being outside and connected to country through things that you can grow and watch grow, and then you can utilize, eat, or make something from, it's just, it's that, it's a con connection, connection to country. And then if you know a story, you know, we've, I've shared a lot of stories and other, uh, Uncle Barry, I think, done some about plants. And then the kids come along with their iPad and they scan the barcode and come up with us telling, you know, the story about Borobi and Gugabar or the red belly black snake or, so they're getting that, and that's the old way of, of teaching, that the, the old people, um, stories and songs connect you through that language to country, which is the plants, the animals, the rocks, the stars, the trees, everything. And it lets you know the seasons. So you, when you know the seasonal indicators, you can move through that story and song to another area because then the stuff over there is ready. But we got it all at our fingertips now anyway, so we don't have to walk too far. Shall we go down here and have a look or is it time to go over, go over there? We better go over there. Go and have a look over there, eh? Okay.
So welcome to Marsden State School's Yarning Circle. I think yarning circles have evolved from the old, what we call the stomping ground. So a borer ring ceremonial site. So I think these have evolved from that. Um, and our culture has been evolving for tens of millennia. So the language is gonna change. The uses of things are gonna change. You know, so we're, it's a amalgam, a lot of different. I just look at it, this one, I remember Grandfather, we were up at Springbrook. Plants remind me of stories and things that happened. And it was raining and he got his little pocket knife. I've still got his pocket knife at home. And he cut off two or three of these and they were bigger. And he showed me how to make a raincoat plant. This is not ginger, it's got some fruit on. Just over here, I'll, I'll get some off for you. But he cut three or four of these and he bent it, kink, and you just hold it like that and the leaves overlap each other and the water was just dripping off on the sides. So it's just the use probably that they would have used. I think this is a, um, not a native um, guava, guava, how do you say it? Guava or guava. There's a native one over in there but I brought some of the uh, different things along and this fibre here, you can make a lot of different stuff from. This is cottonwood fibre. So it's from the, this, is, this tree, you can get string from the bark. You've got to make the string out of that fibre. You can make fire sticks, spears, yeah. And the flowers are good. You can eat the flowers too. So that's a form of native hibiscus. All these deadly baskets here, these were made for me by some ladies up in East Arnhem Land. Pendanus, pendanus leaves. So pendanus grow all along. And this were, these two are grandfather's old fishing bags. So these just go over your head and hang at your waist there and you can put your hand line in. And So that's all handmade out of um, string from natural fibres. But you know, you can get creative <coughs> and these leaves from um, different palm trees, you can soak them in water, fold them up, weave them together and then screw in an old, old piece of wood for a handle. There's so many things, you know, get the kids being creative. These wonderful, anyone know what these seed pods are off? Not from here, Northwest Western Australia, so Boab trees but amazing art that they, but that's just to show you is if there's something in your garden that you think you might be able to grab and use and, and make something with. So it hasn't got to be something that you're eating. There's plenty of medicines there as well. Gumby Gumby and heaps of different medicines. This one just here, the Lamandra grass, you can weave with it. Matt Rush, yep. And the old people used to make flour out of the um, out of the flowers on them. So they'd take all them little balls off and put them in their coolerman or that between on the stones and grind and grind and grind it into a, a very fine powder. And then um, you shake it and the husks come to the top and you just go, blow the husks off, keep shaking it around. And then they mix it with water and make little Johnny cakes. I've tried it, they're very bland. But, <laughs> very tasteless. Let's go to the shop and get a loaf of bread. <laughs> and there's things like, um, I was at an early learning centre the other day and these kids come out with black beans, Morton Bay chestnuts. And I said to them, don't let them open them or put them in their mouth. They're one of the most toxic plants in Australia. Heap of people, a family went to um, hospital a couple of years ago in Townsville. They thought they'd cook them up and eat them because they heard our old people made bread from them, which they did, but they soaked them in a dilly bag in a stream for two weeks, 14 days, and then they cracked them into quarters and then they let them rot in the bank before they washed them again and made them into Johnny cakes and cooked them on the coals. These people thought, oh, we'll just boil them up. <laughs> so you've got to be careful. There is a lot of toxic plants, but Seek out your elders in your area for those people up in Bundaberg and Bowen. There's plenty of elders up there 
uh, with traditional knowledge, just go to your local land council or uh, your cultural centre, ask what aunties or uncles are there or knowledge holders and um, invite them, invite them to your school, invite them to share their knowledge. So we need to, we need to have them impart that to our young people so they can be the ones passing it on in future. We don't want to lose it. There's too much already been lost, you know. So best of luck and best wishes to you all. Uh, go out there and have fun in the garden and seek out all these wonderful things. Thanks, Uncle Boomerang. I wondered if there were any quick questions before we move on to the next part of our program. I think we've been answering questions as we've been going and, look, my mind is just buzzing with possibilities and ideas and thank it's you. It's exciting, oh, isn't it? It's really exciting. And what we need is people to be passionate at the schools. When there's passion in the schools, it only takes one person and then it rolls on from there. It's contagious and somebody else gets that passion. Next thing, you've got a beautiful, amazing space that you can utilise eh, for a lot of different things. And as you know, Susie, at your school here, that, that learning rolls over into so many parts of the curriculum, doesn't it? You know, it's not just ecology, it's not just science. There's so much more. It's wonderful. Thank you. And I know there's a number of schools in this area that either have started a cultural garden or it's definitely something that they have planned. And that is where Pick of the Crop can come and support. We've been really fortunate today to hear from Uncle Boomerang and I know that he is available here in the local area. So please get in contact with him. You know, we've had a taste of what's possible in your schools as well. So thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us. Thanks for listening to us. me rave on. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we could have spent the whole hour and a half yarning. It was just fabulous. Thank you. And it's real. You know, we're seeing it, we're experiencing it, we're, we're feeling it. And, yeah, thank Daily you. Daily work. Thank you. Your way. So for, our, for those of us here, we'll move on to the next part of our program, which will mean we head back inside and we're going to go to Simone Johnston next. Really excited. Thanks. everyone who is online um, we are back in the room now and we are really lucky to have Simone Johnston. Simone is a community nutritionist and she works for the Metro South Health, health Hospital and Health <laughs> Service Metro, Metro South, in the health equity and access team. So she does a lot of work in the local community particularly getting her hands dirty in some of these local community gardens and she is here to share with us some tips and tricks. You might remember when we got you to register for today's session that we also asked you guys, what is it that you want to hear? How can we support you with your school gardens? And so Simone and I looked at the answers that you provided and the presentation today is based on what you guys asked for because there were lots and lots of topics but this is based on what was the most common things that you guys need to really start, sustain and maintain your school gardens. So thank you, Simone. It's great to have you here. No worries. Thanks, Kat. And um, yep, so um, I work for Metro South Health and at the moment I'm doing um, a, quite a bit of work on... Um, supporting people who have just arrived in Australia to stay healthy, so in our Healthy New Communities project, um, and certainly working um, in some food gardens and community gardens is, is part of that work. So first up, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of all the lands that this um, session is taking place today and pay my respects to um, the elders past, present and emerging. All right, so as Kat said, absolutely, the session has been really designed by you guys. 
Um, over, we've chosen the topics today based on more than 50% um, of respondents wanted to hear about these topics. And, um, there's, there's quite a lot of information to get through today, so I do want to make it useful for you. So if you have questions, you don't need to wait to the end. Please just jump in. That's why I kind of gathered you all together so we could actually have a chat. Um, there's no point talking about something that's not relevant, so if you've got a question about it, please ask. Um, the other thing to say is um, I think uh, same I've said to Charlotte, if there are any questions online, um, we'll just try and take them as, as we go along. Oh, the other thing that's probably worth mentioning is um, I'm not a teacher, so in terms of links to curriculum, there's obviously a million ways that gardening can link to curriculum through math, science, HPE, English, you name it, art. Um, but you know, you guys are the experts in that. I'll try to mention some of those things as we go along, but if you have brilliant ideas, you might wanna, wanna share. Okay, so um, before we go any further, um, I wanted to just share a few home truths about gardening. Um, and some of the things I noticed were absolutely echoed, or I'm echoing what Uncle Boomerang said actually. So the first one is that there's heaps and heaps of expertise all around us. There are people on TV, there are people on radio, there are magazines, um, there's your local gardener um, you know, around the corner, and of course all you guys that um, filled out those registration questions, there are actually, I think, three or four people that identified themselves as garden gurus. So I know Don here is one of the garden gurus. Is anybody, <laughs> uh, anybody else in the room? here nominated themselves as a garden guru don't be shy okay Don it looks like you're the expert to help me out today <laughs> all right but I guess the point is is that we're all a brains trust we've all had experiences um, and all of those experiences are valid so um, you know that's in, that's important the other thing that can happen when we first start gardening is that there's so much information out there, it can actually cause us to be a bit paralysed. Oh my God, I read this about pH, what if I do this wrong? There's so many types of you know, wicking bed gardens and this garden and no dig gardens, how do I know what to do? What if I stuff it up? What if things die? You know, All of that kind of stuff. So my suggestion and my hot tip is basically just start. You know, just have a go. It doesn't have to be perfect. Perfect really is the enemy of good. Um, just get going. And as a metaphor for life, there's really no single way of uh, right way to do everything in gardening. You can um, really do what's best for your situation and your environment, whether you know you have money, you don't have money, what the local materials are, um, and uh, you, using um, yeah, local supplies, all sorts of things. So no single right way, absolutely. Um, and don't worry if you stuff it up because everything's changeable. That's the great thing about gardening. Um, and as every gardener will tell you, a garden is never finished. So you, you just, oh, yep, no, that was all part of the plan. We'll just change that or do that. The other great thing about that is it's a really valuable lesson to teach kids as well. You know, it, it breeds resilience. If something doesn't work, you just go, oh, my goodness, and run away and cry. No, you just try again, don't you? You know, like it's, it's no big deal. Um, this is another home truth. If anybody identifies themselves as a good gardener, Don, have you killed plants before? Heaps. In fact, every horticulturalist will tell you that they've killed more plants than anybody else. The more you garden, the more plants you will kill. Do not worry about it, just try again. Okay, the other thing is that gardeners and people who love plants, they're passionate, they're fabulous people, they love sharing their knowledge, um, so use them. Don, I'm looking at you. Um, so make sure you, you, know, you use the resources around you. Um, they love to share plants, they love to share seeds, and they love to share their knowledge. All right, so first up, a uh, quick chat about setting up our garden beds. So you can see these look very posh raised garden beds here. There's heaps of different types. You might have heard, so the raised beds are very nice and orderly. Good thing about raised beds is that they're useful for mobility um, issues. So if somebody's using a wheelchair, for example, um, they can be really handy. <clears throat> have people heard of wicking beds? That's another type of garden. 
So they're a bed that's actually got a water reservoir in the bottom. And um, what happens there is you can see with a little science diagram um, that the water travels via osmosis up through the gravel or that the roots come down and they also can, can suck that water up as much as they need. No dig garden beds where um, it's a favourite of mine. Um, you just lay stuff on the ground and build it up and whack the plants in the top. You might just use whatever you've got lying around, some stones that you find outside for your garden edging, maybe some bricks or something that the neighbour was chucking out on the, the rubbish drive. Um, in-ground beds. So this is um, also very cheap. You might just need a shovel and a, a bit of um, muscle to do some digging, okay? You can make you know, rows like a market garden. If you don't have much space, you can just do a little circle or a square, anything you like. If you have not much space at all, containers. Um, you can even um, just grow in, you know, anything, old buckets. Um, there's a little picture there of some work I did with real little kids where we planted in things we found from the op shop, gum boots and all sorts of stuff, kids' toys. Um, really, you know, there's so much you can do. So how do you decide? Essentially, you do what's best for you. Um, you look at your local situation. So if you're a long way away um, from, say, a tap or somewhere that you can source water from, maybe the wicking beds are a good option for you. They're a little bit more expensive, but you generally only have to top them up once a week. You know, if you've got somebody in the school that you have to please because they're super duper orderly and they like everything looking really posh, you might like to um, do some raised beds and make it really kind of formal looking. I'm really a big fan of, um, I don't call myself a lazy gardener, I call myself an efficient gardener, totally different. Um, but in the interest of efficiency, I just like the no dig thing because basically I can just walk out and go, oh gee, I reckon I'll do a garden here. And I literally just whack some newspaper on the ground, build it up, put some old pavers around it, plant something, oh look, finished, you know, and away you go. So. There's also no rule to say that you actually have to just have one type of garden bed, you know? You can just, again, trial and error. Now, if you think of links to curriculum, what about um, even having some experiments where you get the kids to, like, grow lettuce in a no-dig garden bed and then in an in-ground one and then in a raised bed and look at which ones go the best and write a little report at the end, take photos. I mean, there's so many things that you can do. Really just start where you are and use what you have um, and you just work it out by trial and error. It's nice to have a plan, but you don't always, you know, things change. And, you know, you can read all the books and draw up a plan, but until you really get going, um, you know, you might change your mind about what works best. All right, soil, very important. Um, soil feeds our plants. Got to keep my notes handy in case I forget to say something really important. <clears throat> so soil obviously feeds our plants. It's a bit like um, you know us eating our veggies. Um, the veggies need to have good soil to keep them to keep them strong and healthy. Soil's made up of lots of different um, things. So living organisms like bacteria, protozoa, fungi. Um, but it's also made up of inorganic matter like sand and silt and clay. But rather than sort of worrying about the science of soil, let's just talk about the doing. And again, let's distill it down into, okay, I just want to get something going. Um, what do I do? I would actually recommend if you're going to use in the soil that you've got um, just outside, um, to, which is great, you can actually um, get the soil tested for um, heavy metals. That's a, that's a really good idea, especially if you're planning on having the kids eat the product that you're growing. Um, so there's a really great um, program that's been going at Macquarie University called Veggie Safe. Um, you just jump on their website there, you download a consent form, they've got a little instruction sheet, they tell you how to collect some samples. You basically go around with a little trowel and put some soil in a snap lock bag. Um, you send that away and for the very cheap price of 20 bucks, they will do a soil analysis for you and check that you don't have um, any heavy metals in your soil and then you can really be sure that there's no lead contaminants and stuff. 
Why do we do that? Essentially, particularly with young children, um, they you know, touch the soil, they touch their mouth, they're much more likely to ingest heavy metals and they absorb it um, more than adults do. So it is, um, you know, it's not essential, but I'd, I'd recommend it. Even in your own backyard, um, these guys, they will take any um, soil, just because where we live has um, not necessarily been, um, you know, it might have been an industrial area before it was rezoned or building materials around your house, you just don't know. All right. Other thing that um, we do sometimes when we start a garden is we buy in soil, don't we? We go down to the local, um, uh, what do you call it, landscaping yard and, yep, load up a truck and old mate delivers it. Unfortunately, I have to tell you that pretty much every soil that you buy is pretty ordinary. Um, most gardeners, good gardeners, would you agree, Don? Yeah. <laughs> Please jump in if you, you want to, you know, you want to... Um, share some knowledge. Um, look, the best thing that you can do, if you, and I, I bought soil, and um, at our local community garden at Elm Park, we use a, um, a company called Brisbane Soils. They're probably who I recommend, but I'd love to hear if you've got any other, you know, local um, pearls. Um, you can ask the, the supplier about the pH of the soil definitely tell them it's for growing veggies and for growing food so that they'll direct you to a more premium soil. Um, they'll also, um, you know, often add some, um, you know, premixed manures and things like that for you so that can make your life a bit easier as well. You can also ask them about weeds like nutgrass, which are a real pain to get rid of. Um, and often um, you'll get soil in and it will have the nuts in the grass, in the soil already, and then they germinate, and it's a real pain to get rid of. Uh, it's a bit like cockroaches of the plant world. They just, just those nuts, they survive. <laughs> All right, yeah, but the best advice if you're buying in soil is, you know, chat to Don, chat to people around, um, ask around, see if people have had good experiences. You know, your, your neighbor who's, um, had you know been growing fabulous veggies or whatever chat to them and see what they've done probably the thing though whether you buy in soil or whether you use your own soil um, there's very rare to get perfect soil for veggie growing so you will need to do some improving of your soil so you can check your ph um, easy super easy to do that um, you can buy meters. I'm really skeptical that you just stick in and they have a reading on the top and will tell you whether it's an acidic or an alkaline soil. I'm a bit skeptical about, um, say, if you go down to your local green shed, how good those actually are. Um, I think, you know, for 15 bucks or 19 bucks or whatever it is, um, the, the little indicator kit where you mix um, the soil there and, and take a sample and you read it against the colour chart, that's probably the best thing to do. Um, and then, you know, if your soil's too acidic, you can add um, different manures or composts or things to, to change that. Now, the reason it is important, and look, I'll confess, most of the time I just bung stuff in the ground because, again, efficient gardening, right? So, um, but if you are having trouble with certain things, it's definitely worth checking. And the reason is if something's too acidic or too alkaline, it doesn't matter how many fertilisers or things you bang into the soil, um, the plants actually won't be able to absorb it. So um, ideal vegetable growing um, soil pH is um, between 6 and 7, 6.5 is, is pretty much spot on. Um, you can add things like rock minerals, um, you can even buy bacteria, liquid bacteria, thanks Kat, um, but one of the key things if you've got sandy soil or if you've got clay soil is to actually add compost. Um, Oh, another fun thing is um, there's a little, uh, I think that's a video there of um, Tino from Gardening Australia doing a little soil test. It's a bit like making mud pies. You go outside and you grab a handful of soil and you add some water. And if you can roll it into a ball, um, then it can either be loam, which is good, or clay. Um, and then you roll it into a sausage. And if it breaks, um, it's, it's um, a, a loam, which is good. And if it just bends, it's clay. And if it won't 
don't roll into a ball at all, it's really sandy. And the reason you want to know about that is, is um, really sandy soils, the water just goes straight through them. If it's really clay, it's going to be a bit boggy and plants might get wet feet. So what's the remedy for most of those things anyway? Is actually just compost, making the soil um, more fertile, more organic matter. Again, my top tips for composting, don't overcomplicate it. I'm not sure if you've ever talked composting before, but people write whole books on it. They get really passionate about ratios and um, processes and tumblers over, you know, bins and all sorts of stuff, right? Um, again, just choose what works for you. So if you've got a big space and you're planning on having heaps of fruit trees and you've got a huge um, you know, indigenous garden and you wanna do some trimming and that, and you're gonna mulch all that down, you might need a really big area and need um, bays. If you're gonna start collecting um, even the food scraps from local families to bring into your school, um, you may want um, you know, tubs around the school that are drop-off points. All sorts of different things um, can work. The most important thing is with compost is knowing that you need a mixture of things to compost. So essentially, um, we talk about green and brown things to compost. The green things are high in nitrogen. They're things like um, grass clippings or um, you know, green plants, uh, food scraps, sort of the mushy stuff from your kitchen. The brown stuff are literally brown leaves, paper, that kind of stuff. You mix them together. Look, you'll read lots of different things about what ratios, right? 50-50 is pretty good. I think the, you know, the current sort of ideal ratio is 60-40, 60, a 60, little bit more green stuff. Again, it's fine. If it's not working, you can just modify it. If it's, you know, not composting down, it's really dry, you just add more water, more green stuff, a bit of cow poo, you know, and it'll be right. If it has been alive, you can pretty much compost it. Years ago, like when I was a kid, oh no, you never put citrus in the compost and you never put onions and all of this kind of stuff. At the end of the day, have you seen nature running around going, oh no, we can't compost that? You know, stuff just falls from the leaves um, and it breaks down. Um, yeah, so you just, you just bang anything in pretty much. Um, you know, like if you've just harvested, say, 40 lemons and you're going to have 40 lemon peels, you might want to spread that out a bit over the week as you go, or you're a crazy smoothie person and, I don't know, you've got 100 banana skins. So, you know, just a bit of common sense, but most of the time what we're using in our kitchen or our garden, you just, you just mix it all in together. Technically, all of them, these other things like dairy, meat and bread will break down. Um, it's just more that they tend to bring things like mice and rats into your garden. So in a school, I probably wouldn't recommend those things. Um, you can do things um, like with the meat and dairy, like bury them in the ground. I mean, there's plenty of people that, you know, would go down to the butcher and get a liver or something like that and bury it under their passion fruit vine. Um, to make it um, grow really well. If you do, at, at, particularly at a school and you've got lots of um, bigger trees um, and you're, you know, um, maybe growing fruit trees as well and you want to cut branches down, it's probably not a bad idea to invest in a shredder um, that will help things compost down more quickly. It's not essential. You can, again, you know, um, nature just does it over time. Um, and you can cut things up with your secateurs. You need to add water. Um, we've talked about mice, so don't add the um, cereals and, and breads, um, but you can also use mesh around compost bins to deter mice. Um, again, you know, people will talk about turning their compost and all of that. That's great, it will help things break down. But again, I don't see anybody running around in nature turning the leaves on the forest floor or any of that kind of stuff. That just happens. So, you know, the, the different bugs and animals and that are our little composters and they do all of that. So the cockroaches in your compost, yes, they're supposed to be there. Um, you know, all of that, they do all that work for you. Okay, so if you're a little bit efficient or lazy like me, sometimes I don't turn my compost very often, it will still break down. It is better if you do. All right, so worm farming. Anybody have a worm farm? Oh, nice, see? Oh, cat, I didn't know that. 
Ellen, yeah. So people get passionate about their worms as well, and they are little beings that, um, that are living. So you do have to look after them. The reason you might have a worm farm over a compost is that you will get fertile, essentially natural fertiliser from it. So the juice that comes out is a liquid fertiliser and it's concentrated, needs to be diluted about one to 10, or the actual castings, it's more like, it looks a bit more like soil or a compost after the worms have eaten the food. Um, and that's more like a slow release fertiliser that you can sprinkle around your garden. Some horticulturalists will mix that in with their seed raising mix to really get the seeds going well. Uh, that's a little video there of Costa making a um, worm farm out of a polystyrene box. Again, use what you, you have. Um, just remember, you can't just grab any old worms from the garden. You do need composting worms. Um, the best thing to do is find somebody with a worm farm, these ladies at the front, and um, maybe, I don't know, make them a cake or offer them some lemons or something from your garden and see if you can get yourself <laughs> some worms. What was that? Give them a job. Give them a job, yep, well, that'll probably work. Okay. Um, so you do need to care for them. They, they need to not get too hot in summer, so keep them out of the weather. And also, same thing, if you do cut um, the waste materials up, they will eat it more quickly than if you just put whole things in. Um, the bottom link there is a little video of Jane Edmondson from Gardening Australia talking about the things to do for your worm farm weekly, monthly, yearly. All right, the biggest one, and um, actually I see um, Uncle Boomerang's gone, but um, he was talking a lot and helped me answer actually one of the questions that I was um, having with this session about seasonal planting and he said exactly what I was going to say is that the seasons that we know are nothing to do with Brisbane they really come from Europe and I, I was actually didn't know how many seasons there were in the local area but he told us today um, that they're traditionally the traditional owners say six yep so up north sometimes 12 all different things but essentially the key thing here is to make sure any of the resources that you're using or the information that you're reading or that the people that you're following are from the local area. So a lot of the time you'll pick up books and they'll start talking about planting tomatoes in summer. Well, those people are living in Melbourne or maybe Sydney and below. OK, because that's that's not right. So you need to know that we're in a subtropical environment. Um, so you need to look around and and just like um, our indigenous people did, looked at things that were happening. You need to observe around you and see how the weather's going. I'd really recommend following. Um, so you know, if you're going to follow celebrity people, um, like on Gardening Australia, Jerry Colby Williams is our local person. So he lives in Wynnum which I understand is not Logan, but obviously it's a lot closer than, say, Melbourne or Sydney. Um, there's another horticulturalist that I like to follow. Uh, she has a web page called Annette McFarland. She also does a radio show. Now, she's actually in, I think, the Gap or, no, a um, little bit further out. So it can even there, there can be differences. So her climate tends to be a little bit colder than us, um, but... Yeah, and there's another lady that I love to follow. She's got fabulous free YouTube um, clips, a lady by the name of Morag Gamble. She's a permaculture teacher on the Sunshine Coast. Amazing local um, knowledge. Again, understand sometimes the Sunshine Coast gets a little bit more rain than we do, um, but really got some fabulous, fabulous ideas for South East Queensland. And Simone, if you they're all on the end of the, the thing, but absolutely, <laughs> step ahead of you. Um, so the other thing to consider is also your own microclimate. So, um, you know, like here, we've got quite a sheltered spot where um, we've got brick walls and things. Um, many years ago, I lived in a place called Warrnambool, which is pretty, they call it Windy Warrnambool. It's pretty cold, it's pretty wet, it's pretty windy. Um, and I was always told, oh, no, you won't be able to grow basil here. Well, I grew basil fine, and so again, this is where you just do have to do a bit of trial and error, but I had a beautiful big brick wall and the pot sat right next to the brick wall and the sun bounced off that and just amplified it. So that's an example of a microclimate where um, while Warrnambool generally wasn't a good place to grow basil, it was possible. Of course, it never grew like it does here, which you know will grow up to waist height in the right season. 
So talk to your local people, talk to your community gardens and your local group. You know, as you're walking the dog, go and sticky beak around, see what else um, is, is successful in other people's gardens. Um, so here are some of the things that can give you an indicator of um, what to grow. So this is a free app. This is the Gardening Australia Veggie Guide app. On the left, it's just a screenshot. If you've got your... Um, uh, what do you call it, location services on, it will automatically select that I'm in a subtropical area and it's April and here's a list of things that you can grow. Um, if you, so for example, if I was going to um, plant amaranth, um, I just click that little plus button on the right hand side there and it will say, are you growing from seed? Yes. And it will actually then put it in your veggie patch and you'll have a list of things that you've grown and that's a free app. It's actually pretty pretty good. One of the things I've found that's not entirely accurate is it gives you an estimate of when things are ready. But of course, it's a nap. It doesn't know how much rain you've had, how much sun you've had, or what's gone on. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, what's that? I just said, how well you take care of it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't have um, efficient gardener on the settings. <laughs> but that's probably a, a, good, uh, a good tip for them. Another um, website I use is Gardenate. That's actually a local one. And I don't know if you can see, you can select um, at the top there, Australia subtropical and same sort of thing, select the months. They also have an app. I think that might be about $10, but I just use the website because it's free. There you go. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, I thought it was more than that. I'm, I'm sounding really cheap now, aren't I? <laughs> Sorry, I didn't realise. Um, okay, something else that tends to happen when we first start gardening is that we just go down to the big green shed and we get whatever is there. Unfortunately, a lot of their seeds and plants haven't necessarily been grown for the local area. So I'd really recommend buying seeds from local um, places. So a couple of the ones I use, um, Eden Seeds is uh, Gold Coast Hinterland and Green Harvest is Sunshine Coast. So, um, but again, Don, I don't know, have you got any others? Yeah, okay, so Don uses Eden Seeds as well. If you Google, um, you know, organic seeds, Brisbane and um, you know, look for vegetable seeds, of course. There's a few others around, smaller concerns, but they're probably the main ones. Um, and of course, get seeds from other people. Okay. Um, and of course, as you go on, you can start saving your own seeds. Now, the reason that you want to get seeds from the local area is because what they're doing is they're saving, you know, real, a plant that grows really well in this area. So you're actually capturing that genetic material that grows well here, and then you're replanting that. And so the more you do that, the more you're actually, ca actually capturing the genetic material that works well here, even to the point of in your own backyard. So it's pretty groovy when you think about that. Um, observe, observe, observe. So, you know, what grows well, you only know by, by trying it. Um, get the kids to take photos, write things down, etc., And um, just keep on doing it, rinse and repeat. Um, and the only other thing about when you keep on doing it from season to season, try not to grow the same thing in the same bed. It just increases your chance of getting pests and diseases. Um, another thing I was going to say about plant selection is, and it happens every year I see on my Facebook garden groups, is at this time of year, oh, can I grow Brussels sprouts in Brisbane? Well, look, it's a cold climate plant. Um, I believe, you know, I've heard a handful of people that will get Brussels sprouts in Brisbane. I even know a horticulturalist that when she first moved here was determined to grow Brussels sprouts and she went out every night and put ice on her plants every single night because you need um, something like, yeah, I know, right? Um, you know, less than five degrees overnight for so many nights to actually make Brussels sprouts. Obviously, that doesn't happen often in Brisbane. Um, and I would just say to that, like, why? Why would you do that? You need to be open to growing things that are right for your area. And even and talking to kids about that, you know, the notion that we should have carrots all year round is a new notion. It uses a heap of fossil fuels. It's crazy, crazy stuff. You know, 
somebody's running around putting ice on their Brussels sprouts, whereas I've just chucked a few runners of sweet potatoes in, done nothing for six months, come out and dug up like a, a washing basket full of sweet potatoes. You know, it's honestly, being an efficient gardener, that's the way to go in my book. Um, so, and I've actually brought two examples of some things um, today that are new to me. I actually grew up in Melbourne. I have been in Brisbane now for 20 years, but when I first came, I had no idea what this plant was. Does anybody know? Yeah, okay, and what do you normally do with rosellas? Okay, yep. Yep, okay. So um, you use the calyx, the, the red part, and you cook it up with some water and some sugar, um, and you make jam. Now, um, the other thing to be open to, and Uncle Boomerang talked about this, is using all parts of the plant. So in Asia, people don't actually use the calyx at all. They just use the leaves. They're really high in vitamin C. They're quite lemony. You can use them in soups and luxes. Um, if you come to my place for um, uh, eggs on toast with spinach and mushrooms, you will get rosella leaves chopped through your eggs, uh, your, your spinach. I, can't, I just use whatever's there. So using all parts of the plant, like, you know, some of the notions we have that you can only eat this part of the broccoli or whatever, making sure, of course, that, um, you know, certain parts aren't poisonous. There's very few plants, maybe rhubarb leaves is probably the only one but that I can think of off the top of my head, but really, um, you know, it's just craziness. So exploring that and exploring that with your kids. A lot of cultures don't actually eat the pumpkin fruit that, that you and I probably eat, they just use the leaves or they do both. Um, and when you think about the fact that we grow this vine all year and it starts taking over your entire yard and all you do is just eat the fruit, it seems absolutely mad. Okay, I'm getting the wind up. Keep going. So, as you can say, <laughs> I, get, um, I get a bit passionate. Okay. Oh, look, maintaining enthusiasm. Could there be any more enthusiasm? Definitely get as many people in your school involved, um, not just the students and the teachers, but also um, look at who else that you can, can rope in um, to help you, even outside of the school. There may be some NGOs that can help over, so non-government organisations that can help over um, the summer. We used to have um, a local organisation called Recklink come to the community garden. They had a land management course for disenfranchised young people, and um, so those guys would do awesome weeding and helping out. So there, there are lots of things. I just encourage you to explore that so you don't have to do it all yourself. Definitely embed things into the curriculum because obviously the more it's in the curriculum, everybody's doing that together. Um, tell people how good it is and how good you are and how great the students are. Parents would love to see videos of their kids growing stuff, of their kids selling stuff, um, you know, awards for the best tomato grower or whatever. All of that stuff makes people think that they couldn't imagine the school without the garden. Um, you can even use the garden as a venue for other non-garden things. So again, it just makes it so that the garden is part of your school. There's no harm in outsourcing. So if things have gotten a little crazy over summer, which they always do at my garden, because um, certainly in Brisbane and I'm sure most of the state of Queensland, um, you'll just find it gets you know hot, you get busy, there's family things to do, and the weeds get up to your waist height. If you need to, why not pay someone to come in and help you out with that? You know, you, sometimes people will charge like 25 bucks an hour and four hours work with a few people like that, um, um, you know, you might get everything cleaned up. You just need to tell them that they um, can't use, say, Roundup or something in your garden if it's food. Um, and yeah, no one's going to die if you take a season off or there's a few weeds, so it's not the United Nations. <laughs> All right, so here is a list of some of the um, resources that I've talked about. Um, check out local garden clubs. Um, I had a look online. I couldn't see many in the direct Logan area. There's Eagleby Garden Club and there's also an organic garden club um, down at the um, Gold Coast as well. All right, thanks, guys. You've been awesome. Yes, sure. Question. Uh, yeah. Okay. There's a big difference between home compostable and industrial compostable. 
Okay. So industrial composting, you know, we're talking much higher temperatures, volumes. They're not lazy. They they <laughs> they turn things. They water things. So um, so it needs to really say home compostable, and you can try it. The other thing is you really um, yeah want to make sure it's really compostable and not just sort of says degradable because things can look like they're breaking down. Like and tea bags are a really great example. For 20 years I was composting every tea bag, um, and I actually found out that a lot of tea bags actually have a fine layer of plastic through them so they do break down into microplastics yeah so not great there are tea bags on the market that don't though um, so that's you just need you you find out these things as you go along so any questions happy just shoot me an email or talk to Kat and um, yeah happy to help Thanks so good much. luck guys <laughs> Okay, thank you so much, Simone, and I will save these slides and send them around to you guys so that you can refer back to them. There's so many useful video links and resources and apps, and again, I thought my mind was blown after the first session, but it's like whew, so much going on in there. Um, thank you, Simone. We're coming up to now the last part of our program. We've got Alan Beaumont here from Logan City Council. Now, Alan is part of the community services team and she is coming to share with us a little bit more about what's available here in the local area. For those of us that are online, I know there's some people joining that are based in Logan. Hang around if you can, because you might be sparked with ideas of what could be available in your local council or what to go and hound them for if it's not available yet. So thank you, Ellen, for coming and joining us this afternoon, and I'll throw over to you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Lovely to be here and I'd like to start by thanking Auntie Robin earlier um, for her welcome and supporting the pick of the crop today. Um, it's great to see her again after some time off. So um, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land across the city of Logan. And Logan City Council extends that um, respect to the elders past, present and emerging as they hold the memories, traditions, cultures and hopes of Australians first people. And like we've heard from Uncle Boomerang, the knowledge of the land, um, the plants, and, and to be able to pass that on, it's a privilege to be here today. So my name's yeah, Ellen, and I'm from Logan City Council in the community development team, and we're portfolio based. So I'm lucky enough that my portfolio includes community gardens. So um, yeah, it's a passion of mine. I don't think I'm an avid gardener, but that's why I like doing it. So I'm learning from going from a balcony garden to a backyard garden. And, I think most of the time I just do a lot of weeding at the moment. Um, so that's probably how to outline my gardening skills is by doing a lot of weeding. Um, but my talk today is a quick 15 minute chat just about some of the council resources and what's available. Um, I, I didn't do slides like Simone's which are fantastic but I think our Logan City Council website will pop up and what I'll share today are, are resources that you can find on the council website. and. For those of you outside of, of the Logan area, definitely encourage you to jump on your local government's website. Um, yeah, every, every regional council will have a community team, um, an engagement team or resources and information that, that I'll similar be sharing today. So um, some, I know Simone from our community gardens in Logan, so we have nine in Logan that I'm aware of. There's probably more that we don't know about and if you know any that I don't know about, let me know because we keep a list on our website. So these are across council land, which we lease to garden groups and on private land and in places like schools. So gardens are everywhere. Um, and we do have a garden policy that if they're on council land, we follow that policy. So part of my role is supporting the garden groups navigate, you know, councils, numerous internal staff and branches and resources and support. So I love coming to work because I get to hang out with garden groups. We have a lot of programs. Does anyone know about the Live Well Logan program? Yeah, so I'll share a booklet with you today, but this is online as well. And similar to the Crank School Holiday Program, we have the community gardens listed in here, but we also have a range of cooking classes that gets booked out really quickly. So there's courses in here, um, free and low cost, so up to $5 or less. Um, one of the workshops we've got at the moment is introduction to sourdough cooking, but you get to learn a whole lot of, of things about different food. And in our next booklet, we'll have an inclusive green thumbs where they grow the veggies and then learn 
meals and cooking those veggies that people have grown. So keep an eye out for, for this booklet because there's lots of awesome things to do, especially in the school holidays under Crank. So I'll share that around. Um, another resource that we have are our community project grants. Um, has anyone been familiar with these grants? Previously, schools weren't able to apply, so now in Logan, schools can apply. So we've reviewed our grants over the last sort of 12 months or so and changed a lot of the eligibility and the red tape. Um, filling out grants, as you all know, is a long process. It's a lot of paperwork and, you know, it's, it's like doing a school assignment all over again. <laughs> and we've tried to make that um, an easier process and, for example, we had two rounds per per year in previous times, whereas now it's all year round. So that's a, a benefit to these grants. And we have um, community project grants and then community response grants. So if you are interested in doing like a bush tucker garden with a school and a local community group, that's the sort of things that we could fund and support you to do an application. And you'd contact myself or um, Kate, our community development grants officer, and we can support you through that application process. Um, the grants are up to $10,000 um, and the applications are, yeah, pretty easy. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, if I could do them, you could do them. Um, but they... So, so Alan and I were saying, you know, for the next phase, pick the crop in your schools yeah. to keep these projects going. Yeah. Um, if you could do a really good idea and that's something that I can certainly support the local schools with, Alan. Yeah, and that's something you can contact me afterwards as well. But the purpose of the grants is to build an engaged and inclusive community, um, promote increased participation in community life, support the community to shape or make change in your local area. So all those things you'll be doing through this program. Um, we have, you know, application with any grants, there's um, public liability that you would need. You'd need to have an ABN. Um, so state government entities, including schools, can apply. Um, so we do have a, like eligibility criteria. Um, that are all listed out on our website and um, on this guideline here that I brought to share with you. So new initiatives or projects that build upon or extend an, initi an existing initiative. So yeah, we can definitely talk to you further if you're interested. Um, and what I generally say to the groups that I work with is to look at the selection criteria and just answer the questions and that will really help you form your project plan. Because I've also found um, some people can get overwhelmed with the idea of developing a project or a program because, uh, you know, you need all this evidence and data and, uh, you know, huge thing. But it's just mapping out your project. Like another garden group recently have applied for a 12-week program. Each month they're going to do a different gardening activity or workshop. So that's something that, you know, is under application and, and we can support. So um, now I'm conscious of time. So that's the grants. Um, <laughs> What's that? That's really important to hear about. Yeah, that's the main thing. So, yeah, definitely refer you. We have a community service e-newsletter. Encourage you to sign up because then you can find out what's happening in Logan. And if you have any events or information, um, you can send it into that fortnightly e-newsletter. We have a environment team. So within council, we have environments, we have parks, we have health and safety. So on our website, we have all the environmental programs, pest management, plants, sustainable living. So everything that's sort of been covered today, we have information and resources on council website. So about native plants, about pest plants, um, about waterways, fishing, reporting wildlife as well, because as you're building you know, more sustainable areas, you're going to attract more um, native species and, and wildlife. Um, and even what types of animals are in Logan. So yeah, I did a bit of a research on our website today. And I was like, oh, I didn't know that was there. That's <laughs> So it's um, yeah, really great to see. Council has a lot of resources. Um, and yeah, food, and, um, food safety at work and at school. So there's fact sheets you can download for your schools and for your community groups. And we have lots of networks. Um, street services guide, a community profile. So even helping you develop your grant, we have resources that you can use to apply for your grant and funding. Um, I definitely encourage you to jump on Council's website and have a look or contact myself in our community development team. So we're portfolios based, so in every, every area where there's people, in, in every, any demographic, we have a staff assigned to that sort of area. So um, do you have any questions sort of from a 
sort of I've sort of rushed through that knowing that we've got to finish up now. So is there I'll pass it back to you. Um, but Thank you. I've got some booklets if you want to take home. Yeah, maybe we can put the booklets on the table on the way out. And yeah, another thing that may have been on your longer presentation, and sorry that we've had to cut you short, but something that Alan and I have spoken about in terms of community groups are that there's men's sheds out in the local community. There are over 55s groups that are ready and willing to find schools to work with, to volunteer with. Now that there's a little bit less of the COVID red tape around schools and let's keep fingers crossed it stays that way. But yeah, let's keep connected with Alan and council and how can we keep sustainable links and work within groups that are existing within our community to keep our pick of the crop programs going. So, wow, what an afternoon. It went by in an absolute flash. Thank you guys so much for supporting this event. Uh, thank you guys online for sitting there and listening and learning along with us and for sending some questions in as well. Um, lots coming up in this term and beyond. So let's stay in touch. Let's keep connected with our community. For you guys in the regions as well, we'll look forward to hearing some stories from Bowen and Bundaberg. If you haven't already joined the Pick of the Crop Facebook group, this is a way that we can continue to share our success. Also ask questions and brainstorm challenges as a community. So we're really looking forward to continuing to develop our Facebook group. I'm going to finish up there. Thank you again, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you. <laughs>